The notion that all scientific models and theories are approximate and that their verbal interpretations always suffer from the inaccuracy of our language was already commonly accepted by scientists at the beginning of this century when a new and completely unexpected development took place. The study of the world of atoms forced physicists to realize that our common language is not only inaccurate, but totally inadequate to describe the atomic and subatomic reality. Quantum theory and relativity theory, the two bases of modern physics, have made it clear that this reality transcends classical logic and that we cannot talk about it in ordinary language. The problem of language encountered by the Eastern mystic is exactly the same as the problem the modern physicist faces. Both the physicist and the mystic want to communicate their knowledge, and when they do so with words, their statements are paradoxical and full of logical contradictions. These paradoxes are characteristic of all mysticism, from Heraclitus to Don Juan, and since the beginning of this century, they are also characteristic of physics. In atomic physics, many of the paradoxical situations are connected with the dual nature of light, or, more generally, of electromagnetic radiation. On the one hand, it is clear that this radiation must consist of waves, because it produces the well-known interference phenomena associated with waves. Here's what happens. When there are two sources of light, the intensity of the light to be found at some other place will not necessarily be just the sum of that which comes from the two sources, but may be more or less. This can be explained by the interference of the waves emanating from the two sources. In those places where two wave crests coincide, we shall have more light than the sum of the two. Where a wave crest and a wave trough coincide, we shall have less. The precise amount of interference can easily be calculated. Interference phenomena of this kind can be observed whenever one deals with electromagnetic radiation and forces to conclude that this radiation consists of waves. On the other hand, electromagnetic radiation also produces the so-called photoelectric effect. When ultraviolet light is shown on the surface of some metals, it can kick out electrons from the surface of the metal, and therefore it must consist of moving particles. A similar situation occurs in the scattering experiments of X-rays. These experiments can only be interpreted correctly if they are described as collisions of light particles with electrons. And yet, they show the interference patterns characteristic of waves. The question which puzzled physicists so much in the early stages of atomic theory was how electromagnetic radiation could simultaneously consist of particles that is, of entities confined to a very small volume, and waves which are spread out over a large area of space. Neither language nor imagination could deal with this kind of reality very well. Eastern mysticism has developed several different ways of dealing with the paradoxical aspects of reality. Whereas they are bypassed in Hinduism through the use of mythical language, Buddhism and Taoism tend to emphasize the paradoxes rather than conceal them. The main Taoist scripture, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, is written in an extremely puzzling, seemingly illogical style. It is full of intriguing contradictions, and its compact, powerful, and extremely poetic language is meant to arrest the reader's mind and throw it off its familiar tracks of logical reasoning. Zen Buddhists have a particular knack for making a virtue out of the inconsistencies arising from verbal communication, and with the koan system, they have developed a unique way of transmitting their teachings completely non-verbally. Koans are meant to make the student of Zen realize the limitations of logic and reasoning in the most dramatic way. The irrational wording and paradoxical content of these riddles makes it impossible to solve them by thinking. They are designed precisely to stop the thought process, and thus to make the student ready for the non-verbal experience of reality. 
Perhaps the best known of these is the classic, you can make the sound of two hands clapping. Now what is the sound of one hand? All these koans have more or less unique solutions, which a competent master recognizes immediately. Once the solution is found, the koan ceases to be paradoxical and becomes a profoundly meaningful statement made from the state of consciousness which it has helped to awaken. Here we find a striking parallel to the paradoxical situations which confronted physicists at the beginning of atomic physics. As in Zen, the truth was hidden in paradoxes that could not be solved by logical reasoning, but had to be understood in the terms of a new awareness, the awareness of the atomic reality. The teacher here, of course, was nature, who, like the Zen masters, does not provide any statements. She just provides the riddles. The solving of a koan demands a supreme effort of concentration and involvement from the student. In books about Zen, we read that the koan grips the student's heart and mind and creates a true mental impasse, a state of sustained tension in which the whole world becomes an enormous mass of doubt and questioning. The founders of quantum theory experienced exactly the same situation, described most vividly by Heisenberg. Quote, I remember discussions with Bohr, which went through many hours till very late at night and ended almost in despair. And when, at the end of the discussion, I went along for a walk in the neighboring park, I repeated to myself again and again the question, can nature possibly be so absurd as it seemed to us in these atomic experiments? Unquote. Whenever the essential nature of things is analyzed by the intellect, it must seem absurd or paradoxical. This has always been recognized by the mystics, but has become a problem in science only very recently. For centuries, scientists were searching for the fundamental laws of nature underlying the great variety of natural phenomena. These phenomena belong to the scientists' macroscopic environment, and thus to the realm of their sensory experience. Since the images and intellectual concepts of their language were abstracted from this very experience, they were sufficient and adequate to describe the natural phenomena. Questions about the essential nature of things were answered in classical physics by the Newtonian mechanistic model of the universe which reduced all phenomena to the motions and interactions of hard, indestructible atoms. The properties of these atoms were abstracted from the macroscopic notion of billiard balls, and thus from sensory experience. Whether this notion could actually be applied to the world of atoms was not questioned. Indeed, it could not be investigated experimentally. In the 20th century, however, physicists were able to tackle the question about the ultimate nature of matter experimentally. With the help of a most sophisticated technology, they were able to probe deeper and deeper into nature, uncovering one layer of matter after the other in search for its ultimate building blocks. Thus, the existence of atoms was verified. Then their constituents were discovered, the nuclei and electrons and finally the components of the nucleus, the protons and neutrons, and many other subatomic particles.